from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Snowflake is at a crossroads. The company which defined the modern data platform is facing fresh challenges on multiple fronts. We see Snowflake advancing its data cloud vision while at the same time trying to become an AI leader and a platform for data apps. Market forces are pressuring Snowflake's core value of simplicity, efficiency, and trusted data. Specifically, our premise is that open storage formats and a shifting point of control toward data catalogs that govern and define data, along of course with the AI wake awakening, will test Snowflake's ability to extend its value proposition, create new moats, and compete in new market territory. Moreover, while Snowflake has historically thrived in the face of hyperscale competition, it did so with a superior value story in a market that it essentially created. Snowflake has been taking, talking about adding Gen AI more pervasively. Now, as the modern data platform is redefined, Snowflake risks jumping from the frying pan into the fire, depending on how it adds Gen AI to its product. Snowflake has the strongest engine but competitors who make specialized tools to serve business analysts, data scientists, data analysts, and end users may be best positioned to add Gen AI. Now, if Snowflake is going to compete directly with those firms, it needs to surface functionality from its engine and metadata that differentiates and simplifies the Gen AI experience in a way that other tools cannot. To succeed in its new ambitions, the company we believe we'll have to execute flawlessly on both organic and inorganic innovation vectors while attracting new personas, an ecosystem of developers and balancing profit margins as a public entity. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, Cube Research Analyst George Gilbert and I share how we see the next data platform, what we sometimes call the sixth data platform evolving. And we'll give you a preview of what we expect at ne next week's Snowflake Summit. George, thanks for the collaboration. Good to see you. Good to see you, Dave, as always. All right, Snowflake's leadership position was earned because it had a superior product. Its visionary founders saw that the cloud allowed it to separate compute from storage and have virtually infinite scalability on demand. By building an integrated data platform complete with governance, it had tight control over the data and became a trusted source of analytical data. This well-integrated system made it easy for partners to add value in areas such as data pipelines and data quality, which also allowed the company to pioneer facile and trusted data sharing across ecosystems. The company built its stack on top of cloud storage and developed an extremely efficient compute engine in the form of a modern cloud database with built-in governance from Snowflake and its ecosystem partners. As it evolved beyond the notion of a cloud data warehouse into what the company calls a data cloud, a next logical TAM expansion strategy was to become the app store for data applications. Now several forces have combined to change the game. The AI awakening has accelerated demand for new ways of interacting with data and competitive press pressure has separately created the demand for open data formats like Iceberg. No longer does it suffice to separate compute from storage, rather customers want to apply any compute to any data in an open read-write model that is governed. This demand for openness has shifted the data platform moat toward catalogs that are becoming the new point of control. Now last June, Databricks announced its Unity catalog. Now Databricks, remember, never owned the data the way Snowflake does. It had nothing to lose. So it changed the game with Unity which includes both technical and governance metadata and essentially shifts the point of control to an open format. George, please pick up on this and explain the trend and the paradox that Snowflake faces in responding. Okay, so Snowflake defined the modern data stack, but it was an integrated stack that included compute storage and governance from a single vendor. So as you were saying, it did separate uh, compute and storage, but um, competitive pressure is is now making it so that customers want to separate compute, any vendor's compute 
from the data, and that's different. Compute and storage gave this gave you scalability, as you mentioned, but again, it was a single vendor's compute. So what's critical about this is when compute and storage came from the same vendor, all your data was in a wall garden that belonged to that vendor. And so that was why it was natural for Snowflake to add functionality for different workloads like Python um, inside Snowpark so that they could do more data engineering or um, data science workloads, things like that. It meant Snowflake was something where you added functionality to get new workloads um, because you already own the data. Now, if customers are demanding that any compute engine can read and write open tables, then Snowflake doesn't automatically own the data and all the add-on workloads. And that's ultimately what Lakehouse competition from Databricks, Starburst, and others have done. Now, in this world, you've got um, Spark, Databricks SQL, which are actually two separate engines, Trino, which is an open source product on, on which uh, Starburst is built, and other specialized engines that can all read and write the data. And, and it's open table formats like Iceberg and Delta that change this world from a separation of compute and storage from one vendor to separation of compute and data from other vendors. And then, so here's the thing, then governance, like what defines the data that tells you um, what's there in the data, what's connected to what, what all the lineages, um, all the, the data about quality and observability, that has to move from being attached to the DBMS compute engine to the table storage because any compute engine is gonna need access to that metadata. And so that changes the source of truth from this DBMS centric modern data stack to a governance centric metadata catalog. And that's the significance of Starburst's Horizon metadata catalog and Databricks's Unity catalog, which they introduced last year. And, and then really quickly, all the tools for developers, data engineers, data scientists, data analysts, they get their power and simplicity from the metadata catalog. So the big question for Snowflake next week is, um, how Snowflake, Snowflake explains this transition to customers and partners, how they're gonna take them into this new world. Great, thanks for that, George. Let's double click on this challenge a bit. This graphic here adds additional color by showing iceberg and native tables in the mix. So a key challenge for Snowflake is as it responds to demands for open table formats, it must extend its value proposition to those open data tables. And to do so, it risks handing off its moat to the broader industry. And at the same time, it could bring iceberg tables into its platform and make iceberg a first class citizen with full integration and governance and read write access. But in doing so, that runs somewhat counter to the trends toward openness. So the vision of the six data platform, as we call it, is that any compute engine, as George was saying, can read from, from, it read from and update open tables, rather than simply separating compute from, from storage, which defined the fifth data platform, the future, we believe, will allow any compute full access to any data and be governed. So George, how does this get reconciled or, or does it? So it, you know, this sounds like it's an arcane thing. What table format do you support, you know, and, and how well, but, you know, as we were, we were just talking about that this changes the entire architecture and business model of, of a data platform. So Snowflake announced support for iceberg tables um, at least a year ago. And, but like, you know, I like to say passengers on the Titanic not all iceberg tables are first-class citizens, and, and we know what happened to the Titanic passengers who weren't first-class citizens or first-class passengers. Um, so Snowflake has something called managed iceberg tables. They get all the rich governance and metadata that enables them to plug into all of Snowflake's functionality with simplicity and, and performance. Um, and Snowflake can manage these, that's why they're called managed iceberg tables, and they, they read and write them as, as if they were Snowflake, Snowflake uh, native tables. Um, the advantage of using the iceberg format here is that third-party tools can read managed iceberg tables 
without going through the Snowflake database. That's where it's prying it open just a little bit. Now, there's another type of iceberg table, what they call unmanaged or external tables. And these essentially live outside the data platform. And customers are responsible for storage, for governance, for performance tuning. But third-party tools can read and write these tables, but they lose the governance and metadata that makes the managed iceberg tables a seamless and simple part of Snowflake workloads. So in other words, we've got external iceberg tables that are second-class citizens. And then um, we've got this big question, if, when, and how these iceberg tables can become first-class citizens, both within Snowflake and externally. And when that happens, that's when Snowflake will have fully separated compute from data. Right now, it's, it's a partial in-progress work and so that's what we want to see next week. And you know, this will require, crucially, this is the test, moving the governance and the metadata from something that's integrated with the DBMS compute to something that's integrated with the data. And that's then the new point of control. That's what Unity did last year and took everyone by surprise. Great. Um, okay, so Moving right along, we were kind of joking up front that Snowflake is jumping from the frying pan into the fire. Here's an example of what we mean with the Salesforce data cloud. By the way, it's interesting to note how the, that term data cloud is caught on. Snowflake first used it, Google uses it, so does Salesforce. The Salesforce data cloud is a data management platform which is designed to unify customer data from different sources so that organizations can create a single view of their, their customer data, customer 360. Now with, within Salesforce, business objects are predefined. So all the coding for data engineering becomes a simple exercise in no code or, or low code as you know, configuration. Then Salesforce adds value on top of it. So it simplifies the building of applications with out of the box, low code user interfaces, intelligent co-pilots, you know, adding machine intelligence, visualization, and data workflows. Second thing is these apps, they operationalize the decisions that the analytics in, informs by integrating with the core Salesforce apps and other applications quite easily. All their value add is above the DBMS compute and data storage layer. So George, while Salesforce has the data definitions for customer 360 built right in, Snowflake does not. Is, is this a gap that Snowflake has to fill? And if so, how will it do so in your opinion? Um, Snowflake could um, add essentially data definitions to, to make it work, easy to work with customer or other data, but that doesn't seem to be their, their direction. Um, and what, what, what they could do to complement Salesforce uh, data cloud, um, where you know the as as we'll see in a moment there's a huge amount of customer overlap where they can complement it is make it easier to work with non-customer data which salesforce will then federate access to in snowflake and the other thing is the um salesforce is adding value on top of essentially two open source pro products trino and spark trino was developed um inside uh Facebook as, as a, essentially another query engine, very much like uh, Snowflake around the same time, 10 years ago. And, um, but Snowflake is a much richer engine. It can talk to much uh, um, other data types, data models. Um, it's more, more performant, it's more extensible and more seamlessly integrated. So what they need to do is make it easier to build apps that take advantage of all those capabilities where um, Salesforce customers might be just going to the Salesforce data cloud for customer data and then do all the other stuff in, in um, Snowflake. For example, Cortex is their way of adding Gen AI to the programming model where you don't know anything about provisioning infrastructure, connecting models. You just make these calls that um, from your programming language, whether it's SQL or Python, that seamlessly accesses um, Gen AI models and you get functionality that you couldn't get from those languages on their own. 
And um, those are examples where there are capabilities in the Snowflake engine that the other um, these open source products don't have. Um, the one thing that to to emphasize that Salesforce is real ace in the hole is that they're the data products they produce, the analytic models, whether it's dashboards or ML models, they're connected to operational apps, the Salesforce apps, other MarTech or AdTech, and it's it's seamlessly connected. And what's critical is when you're doing machine learning or Gen AI, you always are learning from experience. And if you're connected to the Salesforce app and, and the model knows whether um, a decision it automated moves a customer further down uh, a lead funnel pipeline or makes a conversion somewhere, that is a critical signal for automatically improving the model. And that's something that a standalone data platform does not have. And even, even um, Databricks understands and appreciates the value that Salesforce has in building these artifacts and, and connecting them automatically to the operational applications. Okay, thank you. So let's let's take another look or a look at another approach, which is highlighted by Microsoft's data platform. Microsoft doesn't use the term data cloud, so that's why we put this in quotes, is for consistency of comparison. But Microsoft has something that no other hyperscaler or data platform has, which is a rich no code, low code tool chain built up over a decade. Now corporate developers can use it across Azure, Office, Dyna and Dynamics, and it has an abstraction layer which simplifies talking to all the Azure data services. So Microsoft has done the work to hide the differences in all of its data services. This is in contrast to AWS, which has taken a right tool for the right job approach with very fine grained primitives in each data service, but that adds complexity. The Microsoft approach dramatically simplifies the equation for customers. Now at the compute layer with Fabric, Microsoft does have multiple engines, but in our view, our view is anyway, that they work together well enough, the old good enough story from Microsoft that they can tell a coordinated story. So Microsoft sales teams can lead with the simplicity message and the power of its tooling, and then they can drag a good enough fabric along with it. Snowflake has the single unified engine and they'll lead with simplicity, but they don't have the app dev tools. So here's a setup today, Data, you got data trapped in thousands of different applications and different semantics. And Snowflake has a single unified engine and it's going to, as you said, lead with that simplicity, but they don't have that maturity of app dev tools or the business logic coherency. In other words, they don't have the capability to harmonize the meaning of data across apps. For example, billings always mean the same thing in each app. Salesforce, on the other hand, they don't have that either but it does have the advantage of owning the application logic. And Microsoft, again, has the rich app dev tool sets, but no one firm has all three and this, hence the race is on. George, how do you see this race setting up and playing out? So Dave, what you were touching on there with, with semantics and using the example of bookings, it's really crucial because um, Snowflake is trying to, they, the Sridhar, the, the new CEO has been talking about putting Gen AI more pervasively throughout um, Snowflake. And, and as you and I know, just having talked to Benoit um, from Snowflake on Wednesday, they've always dreamed of reaching all the end users in, in an organization with the product. And, and I, I want to touch on this before I you know, compare with all the other vendors, because there's this critical layer where if they want to expose the richness of their engine, they have to make it easy to connect the language that a end user uses to talk about their business with how the data is stored in the database. And there's a layer between end user language, a large language model and the database data. And that's that semantic definition. It's in Power BI, um, it's in Looker, it's in DBT, it's in at scale. That one critical layer it's 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 always been useful for for BI tools, but it's going to be even more critical for natural language, you know, interaction with data. And that was the single biggest element that Matei 
um, the creator of Spark and the co-founder of Databricks highlighted when he introduced Unity last year. He was like, all these Gen AI interfaces to data don't work unless they understand the language of your business. And so that's something we're going to be looking for next week. Anyway, now talking about the bigger competitive battle, Microsoft is basically saying, build your apps, Mr. Corporate Developer, across all our services, Office, Azure, Dynamics. And while you're in that environment, you're going to have our DevOps and our security. And then you just attach Fabric as your data layer rather than some specialized best of breed tool like Snowflake or Databricks. Or if you really, really want, you know, that specialized best of breed player, you, you can sort of plug it in as a little component within our bigger stack. In other words, Microsoft is finally selling their entire corporate product line as one big SKU. That's always been their dream. And they've always tried to do that every era. It's just a very big stack now. And it's all come together really with Copilot Studio because that makes it possible to build um, richer interfaces, not just chat interfaces, but now agents that work across all the products. So the, the point of mentioning that is that Snowflake has to decide, do they want to compete head to toe with something like this? And with Salesforce, which is also selling this big end-to-end -end stack where the data cloud came together now in the last year, and it finally gives um, Salesforce an extensibility story um, for the entire Salesforce product line. So Snowflake has to decide how much of that surface area do they want to compete with, or do they want to be a really strong engine that none of those other guys can, can compete with? So um, that's uh, that's the, the key story that you know we'll be looking for for next week. Do they do they want to be a provider of analytic products on a on a powerful engine? Or do they want to be, as Benoit has said, you know, the iPhone and and competing for the whole stack? Yeah, and that's a TAM ex expansion strategy that you know will justify their the evaluation. And so I think that is the the direction that they're going. But let's take a look at some of the survey data and some of the competitors in this race uh, to the six data platform. This is data from ETR's January 2022 survey of around just under 1800 uh, IT decision makers. Uh, the vertical axis is net score, which is a measure of spending momentum and the horizontal axis represents the penetration or overlap for each platform within that survey base of around 1800. That red dotted line at 40% indicates a highly elevated spending velocity. Note that Snowflake at the time was hitting record levels of net score at over 80%, meaning more than 80% of its customers in the survey were spending more on Snowflake after netting out those that are spending less or churning, which is very small. The churn was virtually nothing back then, but there were some spending less. Databricks was at the time very strong with a net score in the mid sixties and Salesforce was also very strong above that 40% line, made even more impressive by its large penetration into the survey in the horizontal axis. Now, as we came out of the isolation economy, things were hot, but they cooled off as the Fed tightened. And we saw IT spending growth rates decelerate, and this hit many of the leading bellwether companies. But perhaps more interesting was the progression we saw in the relative positions of Snowflake and Databricks. And we'll show that here. Look what happens when we fast forward 27 months to the April 2024 survey. You can follow those squiggly lines to see their quarterly path. While both Snowflake and Databricks are well above the 40% mark, Databricks market presence, when measured as a percentage of the customers that are adopting the platform, moves to the right, just behind Snowflake on the X axis. And then Databricks spending velocity on the vertical axis is nearly 10 percentage points higher than that of Snowflake, 62% versus 53%. So Snowflake decelerated or dropped 20 percentage points in those 27 months. George, Databricks' big move in the survey was interesting. I dug in and looked at this. It was secretariat-like, and it took place between Q4 22 and Q1 2023. To what do you attribute this change? You know, um, it's a good question. And I think part of it is, um, 
I, I believe it's a, it's a couple factors that both companies for years were trying to say, we ultimately want you, Mr. Customer, to be able to use just one platform, just our platform. Each company wanted to be the sole platform. And I think it became clear uh, in late 22 and early 23, maybe with the introduction of um, or, or the ability to test out uh, Python programmability in, in Snowpark with, with um, Snowflake and with, with uh, Gen AI becoming, you know, so um, pervasive in the consciousness where everyone really saw Databricks programmability as making it easy to work with document chunks and to prepare them for, for Gen AI. I think it became clear around that time that most customers, the big customers were going to need both. So thank you. The, the other piece of survey research that we want to share from the ETR data we're showing here, given that we see Snowflake's TAM expansion aspirations going you know, headlong into not only Databricks accounts, but also Salesforce and Microsoft, we thought it would be interesting to look at the overlap of these players within Snowflake's accounts. This chart shows the same dimensions, net score or spending momentum on the Y axis and account overlap on the, on the X axis. What we've done here is we've isolated on 425 Snowflake accounts. So out of the 1800, we got 425 Snowflake accounts. And what the data tells us is that 45% of those 425 Snowflake accounts also have Databricks, so very high overlap. 70% have Salesforce and 96% are also Microsoft accounts. And then 66% of those 425 Snowflake accounts also have Microsoft database or data warehouse products installed. Now granted, this includes Microsoft operational databases. We don't have the granularity to get to analytic databases only, but George, the point is that these competitors with the advantages that we outlined, they have a major presence inside of Snowflake accounts. Uh, you could say as well, Snowflake is in there and, and going to be fighting the fight, but this presents both a go-to-market challenge and a technology innovation mandate for Snowflake, doesn't it? Yeah, it's interesting watching that because you had 70% um, overlap at, at the bottom of the chart with, um, with Salesforce. And what's interesting is the spending momentum was rather low, but Salesforce's overall spend is so immense, the, the value of their install base, that it doesn't take much in terms of upselling Salesforce accounts to start doing their customer analytics within their um, technology platform instead of within Salesforce to have a, I'm sorry, instead of uh, with Snowflake for it to have a big impact. And, and that's where I think we'll see um, new competitive pressure. We always knew Databri Databricks was a big competitor, but we'll see, we'll see Salesforce as a significant competitor as well. All right, thank you. Let's wrap up with what we want to see or we'll be watching at Snowflake Summit next week. Um, we'll definitely be watching how Snowflake and its customers are responding to the importance of, of metadata, data catalogs. We believe that the moat is shifting and it's on Snowflake in our view to not simply respond, but try to leapfrog and create new value vectors that it can protect and allow it to grow its value over time. And that involves AI innovation, obviously Sridhar Ramaswamy Swami is AI first CEO. Um, they've also got to become the place. This is what you know, Benoit really stresses, the place to build trusted and innovated, the best data apps on the planet and so it's got a lot of work to, to do there entering that new market. Open source is a force. So will Iceberg become a first class citizen? And if so, how? And what will that mean to Snowflake's moat? Cortex is Snowflake's AI and ML platform. And we're interested in speaking to customers to understand their interest in adopting Cortex, what that uptake will look like over time. But beyond Cortex, what other new AI innovations will the company introduce? How's it going to leverage recent acquisitions? How impactful will these innovations be to customers and partners? And what innovations will Snowflake announce for devs? And how will it play with the data app ISV? Specifically, how much enthusiasm is there around Snowpark and Snowpark container services? What new apps are coming out? Remember, 
This is the first year that Snowflake is combining its developer event with its big customer event. And we think that's a very smart move and necessary to advance its value proposition. And we really want to understand how Snowflake and its customers are rationalizing Snowflake's margin model while competing with software only data engineering offerings. George is going to add some detail in this regard where data engineering involves taking the raw data, then that gets turned into intermediate data products and then outputs that business users can consume in the form of dashboards and increasingly AI or ML models. And if customers are using tools outside of Snowflake to do that in data engineering work, which we've picked up on, it constricts Snowflake's ability to really validate the lineage. But George, taking these points as a whole, how would you summarize what you'd like to see at Snowflake Summit this year? Um, these are all these are all critical points, and and I guess I would, I the the big thing is that as you they're all related because as you move the governance or the the catalog from being tied to the compute engine to being connected to the data storage, what you're really saying is you're moving the definition of the data and the the source of truth from a DBMS centric world to a catalog centric world. That's what um, Databricks showed last year. And when you do that, if you keep extending that thought and, and that that sort of that trend, what you're you, what you're trying to say is you're trying to harmonize all the data so that all the operational applications that that you're pooling into this analytic um, data estate, you want to give it a common meaning so that as you use that example, bookings means the same thing everywhere. Customer means the same thing. That's the great innovation that Salesforce brought to this. They harmonized all the data so that it didn't take a ton of code. And then, then you could build applications really easily on top of it. I want to see um, Snowflake move in this direction because it's also related to their um, desire to put Gen AI across all the surfaces for all the personas, the end users, the data analysts, data, data engineers, they still need um, the, the simplicity and power of those experiences depends on the richness of the metadata catalog. So then, the, then we go back to that question, is the metadata catalog tied to Snowflake DBMS or is it tied to the open data formats? Um, these are the questions I'll be looking for Oh, and that one last thing on the point you you raised and the margin model, um, this is a point of sensitivity for Snowflake because um, there's there's this belief, there's this perception in the marketplace that Snowflake is um, not price competitive for doing the data engineering workloads. This is the pipelines that take the raw operational data and turn it into intermediate data and into final data products. And Dave is, you and I saw Benoit was really kind of sensitive about this when we brought this up. But the reality is it's not a problem of Snowflake's engine. The problem is that Snowflake's business model is to include the cloud infrastructure with the price of the engine. And because they have software company margins, that means they're marking up the infrastructure three or four X. I don't know exactly what the number is, but, but to maintain a software company margin while they're reselling infrastructure, that's what's making the data engineering workloads not price competitive. It's not the engine, it's the business model. And if the relevance of that is, if you don't have the data engineering workloads, you can't have the lineage that shows you exactly what happened to each piece of data all the way to the end product. And that's what you build your data catalog on. That's why that's so critical. Well, and irrespective of how much they're marking up the you know, AWS infrastructure, for example, they, they could say, we're not marking it up much. If that's the case, then they're marking up, you know, their own value add more. And so that's the tension there. Uh, but, but it's on Snowflake to demonstrate that it's total cost of ownership for those types of workloads is superior and, the, and or the value is superior in terms of trusted data or governance. And, and that's a battle that, you know, can be fought. Uh, George, excited to see you next week. We're going to be at Snowflake Summit uh, for four days. Uh, it's in San Francisco this year. 
which is fantastic. Last year, as you might recall, Snowflake Summit and Databricks uh, Data and AI Summit were the same week. Now they're, Snowflake goes first, Databricks gets the last, last shot. Um, so it could be an interesting advantage for them because they'll get to see what Snowflake announces and they'll try to deposition all that. But it's a big week, we'll be there all week. We're also at Click Connect. Uh, John Furrier is down there uh, with Savannah Peterson and Shelly Kramer. And then we're also at uh, AWS uh, in New York next week at a financial analyst summit. So we got, we got a lot going on at our financial market summit. Uh, but we, George and I, will be at Snowflake. We're super excited. There'll be a number of members from the Cube Collective. So stop by and see us. Okay, George, thank you. Really appreciate it. Great Thanks, work. Thanks, Dave. All right, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman, who's solo again this week on production. And they handle our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor-in-chief over at siliconangle.com. Check that out for all the news. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. And you can email me if you want to get in touch david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on our LinkedIn posts and do check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for George Gilbert, the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching everybody and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis. <laughs>